Hey, everyone. So today, let's talk about one of the most popular antennas out there in the ham radio world, the end-fed half wave. You see them everywhere, right? They're awesome, super versatile, not too expensive, and pretty easy to get up in the air. But what if I told you that a huge number of hams are unknowingly leaving a ton of performance on the table? Well, we're going to dive in and show you how to unlock your antenna's true potential. You've seen this. I know you have. It's all over the forums. It's in the Facebook groups. This exact phrase gets repeated constantly. The idea is that the magical 49 to 1 transformer just kind of handles everything. But let me tell you, this piece of common wisdom, it's actually a massive myth. And it's not one of those harmless myths either. In fact, this one little misunderstanding is the number one reason, hands down, that operators pull their hair out dealing with radio frequency interference, you know, RFI, when they're using an NFED. It kicks off this whole chain reaction of problems that can be a real nightmare to figure out if you don't know what you're looking for. Okay, so to really get why this is happening, we've got to peel back the layers and look at the basic physics of what's going on here. And this isn't just about NFEDs. This gets to the core of how any antenna is supposed to work. So let's start with this crucial concept, return current. Look, for an antenna to actually radiate a signal, you have current flowing out along the wire, right? But here's the non-negotiable part. It absolutely has to have a path to come back. Think of it like a simple circuit. A dipole has its other half. A vertical has its radials. There are absolutely no exceptions to this law of physics. And this is where things start to go sideways. Because physics, well, it's relentless. If you don't intentionally give that return current a nice, clean, easy path to follow, it's not just going to disappear. The antenna system is going to improvise. It will find the path of least resistance to get back home. So when you hear people say an end fed needs no counterpoise, what is really happening? Where is that mandatory return current actually flowing? Yeah, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? If we didn't hook up a counterpoise wire, that current has to be going somewhere. It didn't just vanish into thin air. And here is the answer. It uses your feed line. The braided shield on the outside of your coax cable becomes the default unofficial, and really, really problematic counterpoise for your entire antenna system. And trust me, that is the last thing you want happening. Now this is where a simple antenna problem explodes into a shack-wide, sometimes even a house-wide issue. Why? Because that coax shield doesn't just stop at your radio. It connects to pretty much everything else. Let's just trace this path for a second. The RF zips down the outside of your coax. It hits the metal body of your radio. Then it flows through your power supply, and finally, it finds its way into your home's main electrical ground. All of a sudden, all the wiring, all the grounded appliances in your house are now an active part of your antenna. Crazy, right? And the results of this are things we've all heard of. You get that weird RFI making your computer speakers buzz, or your smoke detectors chirp when you transmit. Your receiver's noise floor jumps up to S9 because your house wiring is now a giant antenna for every noisy gadget you own. Your signal radiation gets inefficient, and you might even hear bizarre crackling sounds in your own receiver every time you key up. It's a mess. Okay, deep breath. Here's the good news. The fix for all of this is actually incredibly simple and straightforward. It's a simple two-part solution that puts you back in the driver's seat, forcing that return current to go exactly where you want it to and absolutely nowhere else. I mean, just look at the difference here. You go from this chaotic, uncontrolled system where your coax is radiating RF all over the place and your shack is full of noise to a clean, controlled system where your feed line is doing its job and your signal is crystal clear. This is the goal. And this is how we get to that goal. It's just two easy steps. First, we have to block the coax shield from being used as a return path. We put up a roadblock. Second, we have to give the antenna a much better, much more attractive path to use instead. So part one is the common mode choke. The best way to think about this thing is like a bouncer at a nightclub. It lets the good signal, your RF, pass happily right through the inside of the coax, but it stands at the door and puts up a massive roadblock to any unwanted current trying to sneak down the outside of that shield. It completely isolates the antenna from the feed line. All right, so once we've blocked that unwanted path with the choke, we need to build the new preferred path. This is part two, and all it takes is one really simple calculation to create the perfect counterpoise. This is it. This is the magic number you need to burn into your brain, 0.05. This little number, 
is the secret key to figuring out the ideal length for your new counterpoise wire. And here's the rule of thumb. You just take 0.05 and you multiply by the longest wavelength or lowest frequency band you plan to use. What we're trying to do here is create a wire that's long enough to be an effective return path, but short enough that it doesn't start radiating and acting like a second antenna itself. Let's do a super quick example. Say you've got a classic end fed that covers 10 through 40 meters. Your longest wavelength obviously is 40 meters. You just multiply 0.05 by 40 and you get two meters, that's it. Your ideal counterpoise for that antenna is about two meters long or about six and a half feet. Simple, right? Now, a quick note, you'll see some folks suggest using a section of your coax as the counterpoise before the choke. Honestly, I really don't recommend this. You can still end up with RF in the shack. A separate, dedicated piece of wire that's attached to the transformer's ground terminal is always, always the best and most effective method. It's the gold standard. Finally, let's wrap up with a few key installation tips to make sure this works perfectly for you. First, get that choke as close to the transformer as you possibly can. We're talking less than a foot or 30 centimeters. Next, connect your new counterpoise wire directly to the ground lug on that transformer. And this is super important. Run that counterpoise wire in the opposite direction from the main radiating wire. This really helps your radiation pattern. And of course, make sure it hangs free and isn't touching any metal. And that's it, you're good to go. So, I guess that brings us to the big question. Now that you've seen how this sneaky, uncontrolled return current can cause so much chaos on your signal, it's time to ask yourself, are you really letting your antenna perform at its best? Or is one simple missing wire holding it back from its true potential? I'd say give this a try. You might just be shocked at the difference it makes.